All right, welcome to the EMT Pro Podcast, where we deliver relevant EMS content from the field and the classroom every week. Each episode of this podcast can get you one full hour of CE through our partner, emt-ce.com. So head over there for more information. So Dan, really excited to be doing this podcast. It's a long time coming. It's something you and I have talked about for at least a year now. And I think with my business partner, Brian, we've talked about doing this for you know probably five or six years on some level. Um, but let's do an introduction. Let's introduce who you are and your background, and then uh, we'll talk about me for a bit, and then we'll get started. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Uh, I never actually thought I'd be doing a podcast. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. And I think, wow, some of those guys are nerds, and some of those guys are pretty <laughs> cool, but I never thought I'd be on this end of the microphone. Uh, my name's Dan Livengood. I am um, a 30-year paramedic. I have worked in a pretty busy urban fire department for 25 years and on a helicopter for 17 years. Um, some people say that's, wow, that's a lot of experience, but it's a lot of mistakes. So mm -hmm. here we are. Yeah. And I think one of the good things about what we're going to be doing with this podcast is we're going to be talking about those mistakes so that people can learn from them because, you know, the only reason EMS is where it's at today is because of the people who came before us. Right. So we stand on their shoulders and we honor them by making sure that we're going out and doing the best that we can do uh, and treating the patients to the best of our ability with the tools that we're given. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And I feel like I'm kind of standing on your shoulders to a, to a degree because, you know, you're so old and you've been doing this for so dang long. So uh, <laughs> a little bit about my background. I've, I've been in EMS since 2006. So 14 years. Uh, I started as an EMT basic uh, working on a ALS ambulance with a paramedic partner for a couple of years, then got uh, paramedic school and finished in 08 and have been working for a uh, medium-sized uh, city for the last 10 or 11 years. So um, definitely gotten a lot of experience um, with that and have always, um, you know, taken a liking to EMS, even though in the fire realm, that's not really something that, um, you know, is cool or is necessarily as fun as, uh, you know, the firefighting stuff can be, but it's not what uh, you signed up for, is it? Right. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it keeps uh, me employed. Yeah. Oh man, sure does. Uh, so yeah, happy to, um, be chatting with you and hopefully we can, you know, put some of the plans we have in place, uh, together for this podcast. Cause I know we've talked about bringing on a lot of, uh, the contacts that we have, uh, in the EMS community and medical professionals. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to get their take and learn from their mistakes um, and, uh, you know, just just get their take on what they do um, in the medical profession and uh, learn how we can, you know, all get better. So um, real quick, want to discuss the rules for getting continuing education through this podcast. So uh, the plan is uh, you listen here, you can sign up on the emt-ce.com website. Um, they have all the information over there on that uh on that web page. So uh, head over there if you want more information on that. Uh, but basically, you'll sign up, uh, you'll listen to the podcast, take a quiz at the end, and uh, you'll get your CE credit. So um, each quiz at the end of each hour of our podcast will be specifically related to the information we discuss and the types of injuries or um, A and P or you know the, the content that is relevant to that podcast. So. All right, man. Well, let's get go. We're going to discuss two calls today. Um, and I want to really uh, pick apart each aspect of it because there's so much to learn from uh, each piece, uh, I feel like. And, you know, I want to hit it all. So, you know, each piece of the response model, the, you know, the, the patient uh, interactions, uh, other people on scene, how the scene was managed, the whole crew resource management aspect. Um, so Dan's going to talk about a couple calls he's got, and I'm just going to pepper him with questions um, as they come. So, Dan, let's talk about the first call you had. What were you dispatched to? So uh, I was working on a medic unit, just pulling overtime shift on a medic unit, and um, we were dispatched to a sick person in uh, a, a skilled nursing, skilled nursing home. So automatically, you know, my negative vibes start going up because I'm going to this place where it doesn't have a good reputation, usually mm -hmm. bogus calls, and we're dispatched with a truck. And yeah, I'm working in a, my fire department has several towns that we work with, and so I'm working in um, a town that's pretty small, and I wanted to keep the truck in service. So I canceled the truck. That mm -hmm. was my first mistake. Okay. So it's just myself and my probationary partner. And so we are, uh, 
we're going to this call. And so this is where my unconscious bias sets in, right? Where, right. where oh, here I go. Here I'm going to this place again. I know exactly what kind of call I'm going to get. Yep. And so I Because the whole skilled skill, exactly. is in quotations, right? Right. And the one thing that you've already said that I want to pick apart real quick is resource management. So you knew that a truck was coming, but you also probably had in the back of your brain, if I can put words there, that 99 times out of 100, you don't need a truck Absolutely. on a call for this place. Right. It's usually a bogus call. And so, you know, we can talk about it in a bit, but one of the things that I have a hard time with is even if I get burned that one time, I'm still going to cancel the truck if I don't Me need too. it. Because <laughs> I, I just, if you have to keep resources in a busy system, that truck can now go on the next call right. and make themselves available 99 times out of 100. Right. So it's going to burn me once in a while, but it's going to be rare. And I'm going to help more people by canceling it, right, than Correct. by keeping it in service and letting it come with me every single time and then right. canceling them once they're on scene for five minutes. But, and then, so, I mean, as you'll see, as this call progresses, I could have actually called them back at any time. Okay. Well, this is going to be fun. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. <clears throat> okay. So... I get in and I, I'm very sensitive to smell and it really, really stunk in there. And uh, just as I walk in the door. And so I'm walking to the patients. What kind of smell are we talking about? Urine and poop. And, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so I immediately want to get the patient out of there into the back of my ambulance. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a hot summer day. So it's hot in there. You have to smell. Um, as we're getting near the, the room, I already know that the person that's going to do the handoff doesn't know anything about this patient. She says she just got on at eight o'clock this morning. Right. Just saw this patient. It's been off for a week. You know the typical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm already upset about that, and and I can hear audible wheezes coming from the room before I even walk in the door. And so I know. Oh wow! Now, so how how far do you think you are from the patient when you're hearing mm, gosh, wheezes? Ten ten feet. Oh, and geez. so okay. I can I can hear it, and I'm, I'm starting to think, oh gosh, let's get him out, uh, and then we'll go from there. And so my partner and I put him on the gurney real quick. We get him out to the ambulance because that's, you know, that's my office. That's my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to work in a smelly area, the super hot. And so uh, I listened to lung sounds, they're diminished in the bases um, and wheezes uh, upper fields. Mm -hmm. So we immediately started a duoneb mm -hmm. uh, with the mask while I'm trying to prep everything. And remember, there's just two of us. So mm -hmm. there's two of us doing this whole thing. And he's probationary, he's, he's skilled, but he doesn't really know our system yet. And so the hospital is less than two miles away. Okay. So immediately, what should I have done? I mean, just load and go. Right. Start start my nebs. Yeah. Hey, get, get the front. Let's and... just drive to the hospital where yeah. there's a lot of people that can help me out. Yeah. But you stayed in play. But I stayed. <laughs> and it wasn't really like, oh, I'm better than the hospital. It's more like, oh, gosh, I don't want to deliver this, this patient looking like this to the hospital because yeah. my ego says that I can do better than this. And so I'm still in that ego mode, right? Okay. My ego is running the call. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And that happens quite a bit or happened quite a bit. Uh, so I should have, I should have gotten the rig and just drove, yeah. but we didn't. So we took a quick set of vitals. Heart rate was 140. Blood pressure was 72 over 46. SATs oh. were 72% just as we were putting the mask on. And that's uh, like a good waveform and everything. Good waveform. There was okay. no, there was no O2 going on in the, in the, uh, in the facility at all. So it was just as it was. Was he on home oxygen? No, nothing. Oh man. So he's a sick patient. Yep. And you're behind. Way behind. <laughs> yeah. Way yeah. behind. And yeah. that is a horrible feeling. These are the things that you actually dream about at night is the intubation that takes me three hours to complete. And so I, this is how I felt on this call. And so my, so I have heart rate that's 140, blood pressure is super low. My, my SATs are super low. So if you think of the, you know, what the hop killers are the, uh, hypotension, oxygenation and pH. I've so, never heard that before, but yeah. So it's it's hypotension. These are the things that surround a a peri intubation arrest. Okay. So if those are the things I need to fix before I RSI a patient or the patient will arrest. Okay. Okay. So hypotension. So I, I like know that, that I've got I to love, take care. I love of mnemonics, the acronyms, all that stuff. I, I usually get them wrong, but luckily <laughs> on this one. <laughs> so the hypotension. I know what I got to do. Give them fluid mm -hmm. and start leaving the fed. Mm -hmm. So I immediately start out at twelve mics a minute. So your system has levofed. Leave a a yeah. lot of systems only have dopamine if they have a presser. Right. And so Dan, one of the things that I know about Dan is the system he's from is known uh, for really having, you know, some top-notch care and some, a lot of medications that aren't normally carried. Uh, you guys 
push the envelope quite a bit on patient care for right. If, you know the the more progressive department, I would say. We, we have we have the the tools. We just don't usually utilize them to the full extent. Okay. So okay, that's it's a system of way too many paramedics in it, and not enough. Uh, calls and high acuity things to satisfy the paramedics so their skills decade. Gotcha. gotcha. So. Interesting. So started, uh, I started uh, leave fit, 12 mics a minute, gave some dex, do a net. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's dex? Dexamethasone. Okay. So it's a steroid. Steroid, right? Yep. So okay. it's not something that's going to immediately take care of the patient. It's something that's going to help down the road. And that's a drug you guys give in lieu of solumedrol? Correct. Okay. Yeah, we switched to that a couple years ago. Okay. And is that given IV, orally? You can give IV, orally. You can give it just about any way you want. So we gave okay. IV. So okay. we had the IV going, we had fluids going, and we had the levofit going. So okay. now I'm taking care of my hypotension. So I think I'm doing amazing. Yeah. So now the oxygenation, the SATs were 72% initially. We started uh, with a BVM. Mm -hmm. uh, we obviously only had two people, so it wasn't really good technique. We didn't have two thumbs down. We were just trying with our CE techniques. So we were getting mm -hmm. and trying to augment their breathing and try to open up some of some of their their fields. And we had peep on, but you know, I'm not. I'm I'm thinking this patient has an obstruction problem. Their lungs are obstructed. Right. So I mean, it's not like I'm trying to recruit lung. Like they have pneumonia. Right. Um, I'm. So they've the, probably got a fair amount of air trapping going on. Correct. And yeah. Okay. Where were you on this call then? <laughs> <laughs> if someone would have told me that earlier on, we, we would probably stop right now. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to get the, the sats up. Um, I should have put on entitled CO2 at that time, but I did not. We have that capability. Okay. Uh, did not do that. Um, but I know I have to RSI this patient. Right. Why? Because I'm two miles away from the hospital. I don't want to show up without a patient who's intubated. Okay. That's, once again, that's my ego talk. Ego talk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so with the with the levofed, uh, my heart or my blood pressure goes at 96 over 61. Heart rate comes down a little bit. Sats, they top out at 84 percent. Crap. With the duo nebs, uh, with the dex, with the bagging. So I, we're trying to just pre-oxygenate as much as we can. 84% is, is as high as I can go. And this is before we had DSI, or we could use a ketamine to try to, you know, to... So really explain DSI for... So that's just delayed sequence innovation. Mm -hmm. That's where you have that patient where you're trying to get the SATs up, and they either were, are fighting you to put like a CPAP mask on or to bag them. Mm -hmm. If you give them ketamine, mm -hmm. it brings them down a little bit, and, and you're able to, to oxygenate, mm -hmm. try to get some recruitment, yep. and, and that gives you more of a safe zone for your RSI. And this the ketamine is, won't tank their pressure. Won't tank In fact, their pressure. It might raise it a little bit. Correct. Yeah. So ketamine's awesome. It's and then drug. it also will bring them down to the point where you can you can control their airway a little bit better. Sometimes we just use ketamine and like on the helicopter, like a combative patient, mm -hmm. I don't even have to RSI. Yeah. You know, you just walk up to them, you give them a little shot on the side and walk away for a second and they calm down, yeah. lay them on the gurney and off you go. Yeah. That head injury. So uh Still, here I am. I've got my, I'm still two miles away from the hospital, still sitting in the parking lot. Truck is less than a mile away, sitting in the, the recliners probably. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, you canceled them, right? Canceled. They got to go back to them. They're not going to check on me to see what I'm yeah. doing. Right. <laughs> so uh, I used to tomidate as my, as my induction agent. Okay. I should have used ketamine. Okay. Because ketamine with an obstructive patient with an asthma or COPD patient can actually open right. up the airways. Right. So I used to tomidate. Uh, I think okay. it's force of habit of all the years. Sure. Atomidate's that. a good drug, though. Right. It's a good Just drug. Just not ideal in this situation. Right. But, yeah. For an asthma patient, would have been Good for ICP. Yep. Uh, good induction agent. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And we use sucks. And uh, uh, had I had rocuronium, yeah. that would have been amazing because yeah. sucks will eat up your, your airway stores and rock won't. But I use sucks, and I know that he had an oxygenation problem was 84%. So let's go back to the the last the pH. The pH uh, is is a killer as well. So if this guy is is air trapping, he's not ventilating, which means he's not right. blowing off the CO two. Right. Which means if his CO two is rising, his pH is lowering. Correct. Which means he's acidotic. He's acidotic. If you get acidotic, then you can go into bradycardia. You can do. Mm -hmm. You can arrest. And well, it can I, even mess up your ability to absorb and metabolize the drugs you've given. Correct. So 
you're already behind the curve unless you correct that problem. Right. Which I'll let you get into it, but yes. I don't know if it's always our job, so to speak, to correct those things. It's correct. Right. We will right. see that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we do the intubation. Uh, we have a, a checklist at where I work, and the SATs, we're supposed to get them above 95%, and if we, if we drop below 95%, we pull out. Well, I knew that this is 84%, and we verbalize it. So I said, if I get to 80%, because you're watching the monitor, if I get to 80%, have me pull out. This is where you have to have your best airway person, and we only have two guys to choose from. And <laughs> I you guess got I, I guess going, I got so one. <laughs> right. So you're in. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and so I said, 80%, you tell me to pull out. Because I knew on the oxygen desaturation curve, right. that I was right there, that yeah. I was going to pull out. you're at that cliff. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, we pushed the drugs. We kept bagging. And uh, luckily, I had him positioned right, and I got the tube immediately. Stats only dropped to 81%. Okay. So I did well there. How long do you think the tube took from... You know, mask comes off to you're in and you're given a ventilation. Uh, so we use we use apneic oxygenation as well, which is you put the the nasal cannula in, crank mm -hmm. it at 15, and even when they are paralyzed, they're still getting oxygen flow right. down the trachea. Okay. Uh, we're using that. So I was probably in there 30 seconds total good. from mask off to tube yeah, in. That's good. Yeah. So uh, got the tube. I did my five point check. He still decreased because you know he has the lung problems. But so go, let's go over your five point check. Okay. So what are you worried about? I immediately go to the upper bathroom. Just first, first ventilation. I want to check the belly. Make yeah. sure. So you've got your ears on. Yep. You're, you're checking the belly because you're looking for that. Uh oh. Yeah. Extra gurgly noises. Correct. Okay. And I know it's going to take a few breaths to get my entitle for that verification. So I want to make sure I utilize every one of those breaths. With mm -hmm. I'm going to fill up the gut. I don't want. To, <laughs> I don't want to do it immediately. <laughs> right. So negative epigastric. Um, and then uh, positive on it bi bilateral. Awesome. Yep. So you check the right lung, check yep. the left lung. They're not too deep. Good. Everything's good. Everything's good. It was still decrease because of the you know the right. underlying problem, but right. the tube was good. Okay. So then the entitle at this point. Now, yeah, it's good. the entitle immediately goes on. Okay. And but it, I hadn't got it. But so once I did the five point check, I look over and the entitle is a hundred. Oh. Okay. So I'm thinking, wow. I've never seen this. What is wrong? What is wrong? Yeah, you're probably thinking, am I looking at the yeah, SPO2? Like, <laughs> nope, I'm that's in at, the wrong no, spot. That's good. And my partner, you know, I love him to death, but he didn't know. Yeah. And I'm all over the place. And my truck is still, and it's a paramedic truck. I could have used paramedics off the truck. They would have loved to have helped you. They would have loved to. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have to even write the chart. No. <laughs> no, they just needed to come do the they hero stuff and hero go stuff. back home. Right. So I'm looking at that 100, which means I need to ventilate faster. Mm -hmm. I need to blow that off. So your and, brain says, yep. you know, there's the old adage, uh, if end title is high, you fly with your ventilations. If the end title is low, go slow. Go slow. I like that. With your ventilations. But if you just stick to that, that's a problem because you're, you're only considering one aspect for why a patient could be hypercarbic Correct. or uh, hypocarbic. Correct. So, yep. Okay. okay so, keep going. Keep going. This is good. So I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, okay, all right. I tell my buddy, my partner, uh, let's sedate. So always sedate after uh, your intubations. So what do you guys use for sedation? We did, um, we did uh, Versed. Okay. And, and just a, like two and a half. I should use ketamine, mm -hmm. but we used two and a half. Usually, if the pressure's super high, we'll go five, mm -hmm. and then we do fentanyl. Okay, so, good. So you're always treating yes. for pain as well. I am more concerned about the fentanyl than I am the Versed. Absolutely, because that fentanyl's going right. to have some potential other issues, especially with an asthmatic patient. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you guys have any other pain meds besides the fentanyl or ketamine? No, that's it. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's where I'm at. That's where we have to. Yeah. That's all we have. And so then we have a ventilator. Uh, and so, you know, for my two-minute transport, I can put them on the ventilator. Right. So I'm still, still sitting in the parking lot. Still in the parking lot. <laughs> still okay. in the parking lot. Uh, yeah. We're rechecking vitals. Vitals are still good. Um, and title is still 100. So I do my vent and um, vent settings. I've had him in assist control. I had him at 380 for title volume. And I did this, or her, 
uh, because she's about 5'7", I just go off this chart, the arts net chart. And okay. so we go ideal body weight. And so about 380, uh, PEEP of 5, which I really didn't need to do. She had plenty of, plenty of PEEP. Mm -hmm. uh, respiratory rate of 20. IDE was 1 to 2. And so okay. I'm thinking... So the IDE, you're talking about inspiratory, expiratory ratio. Inspiratory, expiratory. And that's one second in, two seconds out. Correct. And okay. that's, that's the norm. You and I right. right now, if we were uh, on a ventilator, that's what we put on. Yeah. But we have good lungs, right? We have good lungs. So I wasn't she even wasn't. thinking that, right? Yeah, okay. I'm still thinking of that number, that 100. Right. I've got to get that number down. I can't deliver this patient to the hospital right. with an end title of 100. Yeah. And so I crank it up. And I, Dan, this is so interesting, man, because I feel like in EMS, we get caught trying to do too much more often than not. Right. And... You know, there, there's people that I know that take it personally that they weren't able to reverse everything that they were thrown at right. with the patient. And I, I just want to empower people a little bit. Like if someone has, you know, let's take it's a cardiac patient. If they've spent 60 years ruining their arteries and they call 911, <laughs> it's not your responsibility to reverse that in two minutes. Right, exactly. And so we have to be realistic with the way we treat patients with the, you know, the abilities that we have, we obviously want to do what we can do, but at the same time, we have to recognize, and I think this is going to be something that comes up over and over and over again on this podcast, is we're not the end result. We're not no. the um, the place that they ultimately need. No. You know, we're, we're there to serve a purpose, to get things going, and to stabilize when we can, and then we drop them off. Right. You think and that that's our cog in the chain, right? Right. Yeah. And you think of the, the cardiac patient. You are... You're taking that cardiac patient to the ER. That's not the final result either. It, right. That ER doctor yeah. is pushing that on to the cardiologist and the cat. Totally. So yeah. you got to just do what's right for the patient. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what you're doing. Okay. Anyway, so um, you got your ventilator settings on. We yep. just went through those. Yeah. So we're and still the, sitting in the... Still sitting in the parking <laughs> still lot. Still sitting in the parking lot. Okay. And then... Uh, so then I keep increasing the respiratory rate, just trying to chase that number. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, she is so hyper expanded. One good thing I did in those calls, I took the, the tube off and yeah. then I pressed on her chest. And yes. Okay. So, so you assisted all... getting some of that air out. Right. You... And then I could fill it all up again. Right. 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 <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. So I did that and then I put it back on. It's still a hundred. So then I, I get this, this flash in my head, like call the hospital. Yeah, you know, re, you've hit that friend. weird part of the of an algorithm, so to speak, in your brain, where you're right. like, "I need to call online medical control. Right. I need some, I need some flipping help." Right. I used to call my dad all the time. Hey, how do I, <laughs> how do I change the ball, the light bulb in my car? Right. Why right. can't I call the hospital? Ask how I can save this patient's life. Yeah. Holy crap. Okay. I know. Okay. So so I called. Ding. Yeah. Make the uh, phone call. Yep. And I get the I get the doc on the on the phone. He said, "Don't chase the number." Just yeah. bring him in, just ventilate him 10 or ventilate her eight to 10 times a minute tops mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a, an obstruction process. She's not able to blow off. She's not able right. to excel. Don't, don't try it or you're going to Did he want it. you to mess with that IE number? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, did so he, he said go, e? go one to four. One to four. One yeah. to four, okay. one to five, mm -hmm. which means your expiratory time is you're breathing Give in. Give more time to exhale. Then, yeah. Because they're going to be going slow. Right. Right. And so I did that. I delivered the patient with an end title of a hundred mm -hmm. <laughs> and she, the doc said, you know, it's been, she's probably been like that for a long time. It's right. It's no big deal. We'll mm -hmm. take care of it over time. Yeah. And that's, and that's what happened. And I mean, I did a lot of cool things during this call, but we did them all by ourselves. There's a lot of stuff to learn from this call. So let's start from the top. Yeah. Don't cancel the truck. Don't cancel the truck. Okay. And no unconscious bias. Because right. that's what's going to bite you. Right. It bites me all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you go in that fire alarm. Oh, this place again, fire alarm. I'm not going to pack up. I'm not going to put my turnouts on. Right. You go in there, there's a smell of smoke. And there's a fire in one of the offices. Exactly. Yep. So we've all been there. So no unconscious bias. Don't cancel the truck. You can mm -hmm. always cancel them. Mm -hmm. If you do cancel them, you can always call them back. Totally. <laughs> they were, Absolutely. They were, they were a mile away. Right. No problem. Mm -hmm. uh, get moving. If it's a complicated patient and you're that close to the hospital, you don't have to be the hero. Right. Just, sometimes the best stuff we do is just drive patient from point A to point B. That doesn't make mm -hmm. our two-year education any less. Right. Because <laughs> the ER doc, right. he went to school for a lot of years. He's going to send that, that patient straight up to, you know, the cath lab, the, the cardiac patient's cath lab. Mm -hmm. so, so get to the hospital. Um, 
I think I did pretty well on the hop killers. The R, the the pH, uh, I didn't address that. Had I put the entitle on, I saw that it was a hundred. I know that if your your entitle it goes up for every ten it goes up, it goes down by 0 0.08. The pH goes pH down, goes down. Yeah. right? So you can kind of gauge that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I did not address that. Once I got caught in that that wormhole of the number, that's where everything just went to pieces. Yeah. Um, I thought my vent settings initially, uh, well, they were they were too high. I don't know why I'm trying to say the respiratory rate was 20 with the IE to one to two. Right. It should have been respiratory rate 10, IDE one to four. Yeah. So you got to think of the injury approach and the obstructive approach mm -hmm. to ventilated patients, and that's probably a whole nother podcast for you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, that's what's going through my brain is, oh man, you've just brought up so many different topics <laughs> in this one call. So that, many things yeah. you can do. Um, and then just, and, and you'll see this on the next call I, I, I talk about is don't let your ego get in the way. Mm -hmm. How do you, Dan, how do you get around that though? Like, you know, um, how do you I'll be get the humble pie, so to speak, in a, that is a whole other podcast as well, yeah. because that, that, that is, uh, an actual a lecture I do. Oh, wow. uh, okay. Um, and it's called airways and egos, mm -hmm. the misconception of airway management. It is, uh, <laughs> You, you find that one call that you, you actually realize that you killed a patient. Hmm. And then it's like you take a drastic dump in your career, in your life, and then hopefully you rebound without the use of drugs and alcohol, which luckily right. I did. Good. Did beat my dog, did beat my kids. Good. Uh, Should have beat my kids, but did beat my kids. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, you find it and then you rebound and then you level off. Yeah. I feel like I've leveled off. There's times so in the back of the ambulance, I still want to, oh, I still see the hospital bed. I want to fire inside this patient right, right now. Right. But yeah, I, I will say personally, I've been in a few spots within yards of the ambulance bay at the ER. <laughs> and I'm either doing the intubation or I'm watching someone intubate going, we're right here. Right. We, we just need to go. Right. Like, and it's okay to, you know, and if you have a good, at least where we work, if we have a good relationship with the doc that's on uh, that's on call that day, they will let us innovate in their well lit, beautiful emergency room. Got a big beautiful camera. Yeah, get you a look camera, at. you know, video laryngoscope right. thing, and yeah, it, it it's a great relationship if you build that. Um, they will definitely walk you through airway management, and it, and it's a great learning experience. Oh, so it's amazing. Um, I would definitely you know encourage people to have those relationships and to build those if they if they don't and um you know a doc might give you the cold shoulder but at the end of the day if you walk in you're like hey can i watch you do this i, I want to learn mm -hmm. if they see you do that a couple three times even if they're giving you the cold shoulder at some point they're going to warm up and say this guy just wants to learn you right know? all she wants to do is figure out how to be a better paramedic better emt right. and you know they're going to give you those at least a spot in the room you know, at the very least. Um, but sometimes we watch those innovations and we <clears throat> think to ourselves, oh, I could do better than that. Right. You know, and that's where I have to really tame myself because I can't. I mean, as much as I want to think that I can, I can't. Right. right. Exactly. And, you know, the, the thing that I've had some issues with is working with people whose egos are larger than mine. And so I'm trying to be the, you know, the humble, right. you know, hey, let's do what's best for the patient guy. And they're like, no, I need this tube. No, I need to do this procedure. No, I need X, Y, or Z because that's what they need. It's not what the patient that needs. Is exactly it, it's right. what is going through their brain that they need to accomplish. Um, and so I found that in those moments, um, having an argument isn't a good idea. No. Nope. But explaining rationally why you're thinking the way you are mm -hmm. um, can sometimes turn them around. At the very least, have a conversation with them after the call's over um, and kind of do a, a debrief, so to speak. But um, and, and something yeah, also it's, it's, a, it's a big thing in our, in our field, man. Is crew resource management. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have, if you're watching your buddy go down that wormhole and you know what's best for the patient, yeah. it's our duty to stop. Say, whoa, mm -hmm. stop. And yeah. I work in a, an area that has uh, a private ambulance. And so it's hard. Sometimes that inter relationship is hard. Um, because we're, they're not our own people, and right. sometimes they feel like we're 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 
uh, us and them. Us and them, exactly. Yeah. And so we just have to remember it's all about the patient. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if you're taking the quiz, uh, just review common signs and symptoms associated with, uh, you know, ALS level ventilation settings, uh, a little bit about RSI. We'll talk about ketamine, fentanyl, um, Versed. Um, so just have those things in the back of your brain if you're going to take the quiz on this one. But um, Dan, one of the things that you brought up was at some point in your career, you're going to find that that call where you go, I think I was the reason they deteriorated. Or mm -hmm. I think my interventions weren't what they needed and I may have caused further harm unknowingly. And the thing that is so important about that is one, recognizing it, but two, what do you do with it once you get that information? And I remember going through school, um, the instructors that, that I had would always tell us, if you're pushing RSI medications and you don't have a little bit of a pucker factor going, you need to check yourself because this isn't supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be, you know, it can, it can give you a thrill. It can, you know, you know, get your blood pressure going and, you know, and, you know, get your heart rate up a little bit. But this is something that is supposed to be taken seriously. It is something that is supposed to be done when that's what the patient needs, not when it's what we want to do or we can make a case for doing necessarily. Um, and so I've used that in a lot of ways, not just for RSI, but, you know, if we're doing a procedure in, in my, you know, your thing you always say is spidey senses. If, if my spidey ses senses aren't up um, or if I'm feeling kind of, you know, lackadaisical about it, that's when I have to step back and check myself because um, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing that we're messing with and we don't want to do it the wrong way. So, And there's so much potential. There is. We have a lot of potential things go wrong. I mean, if someone's out there with my kids doing something like that just to have fun or just to fulfill, to justify their job, you know, like, oh, this is why I went to school. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So upset. Yeah, go back to school. Go do something else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, so let's see. We've got one more call. One more call. Yeah. Um, so let's go through what were you dispatched to on this one and what was, you know, give me the rig you were on, give me the, you know, situation All right. when the call comes in. Uh, I was working on the helicopter. Okay. Um, I was with a newer nurse. Okay. And I already had that I'm going to show off to the nurse thing. And I'm noticing a trend. <laughs> You're noticing a trend, right? <laughs> yeah. So I already had that in my mind as we're going. When we get dispatched, we don't, they don't tell us what we get dispatched on. Mm -hmm. They say it's medical or trauma. And that way, we, if we have to turn around, we don't know it's a pediatric cardiac arrest or we don't have that extra thing that's going to push us into uh, a fog bank or into a wire or something like that. So, so you we, just know you're going to a scene call? Going to a scene call, it's trauma. Okay. That's it. And so we're circling local highway and we see uh, a truck that rolled over, just a pickup truck, rolled over several times. And I see a circle of people around this uh, this patient that's on the gurney, and it's outside. It's not even inside the, the ambulance. Major highway, rural highway? Mm, rural highway. Rural highway, okay. Rural highway. But there's enough cars that have stopped that have created right. a, oh, yeah. an audience. Yes. Okay. A big audience. And so we... Was we, this in the days of telephones? Was everyone, they had their cell phone out? No, this is before. Okay. Yeah. You've thank, been there. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm not going to make an old person joke. Keep going. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so and the patient was inside. It wasn't like one of those MASH helicopters. So the patient was inside the helicopter. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> good. So everyone, no one has their car phone out. Okay. No. Yep. Right. So yep. we're good to go. Okay. So uh, they are, they are, tr I can see as we're landing, they are trying to innovate this patient. And so this is before, okay. um, you know, we really got worked up on uh, what drugs we're going to use, about pre-oxygenation we didn't do. We didn't do any of that stuff back then. It was just throw a couple drugs in, stick that tube in, mm -hmm. and regardless of what your stats were, you've got a good tube. Okay, so, so I tube got, placement was really all you were concerned that's about. That's it. So I immediately come out. I, I say to the nurse, all right, watch this. These guys can't get the airway. So yeah. I come out with that attitude already. Okay. And so, and I don't know if I did this or not, but this is what the nurse said. She said, I whipped off my helmet. Oh, wow. And I didn't have long hair, but I 
flow in my head like this, you know, yeah. my hair's going back yeah. and forth. Like wish you I guys could see Dan oh right my now. Gosh, yeah. it, like I was going to say the neck whip. Day. Yeah. <laughs> and I swear I had a laryngoscope in my holster because mm. it was just right there in my hand <laughs> and people parted way like this. And I go in and in my mind, I immediately went down there and just stuck that tube right in. Yeah. I had no idea. It probably took me quite a bit, right? Yeah. You didn't even introduce yourself. You just no, told the guy just to move. out of my way. Yeah. I'm a flight medic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hold my helmet. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, the patient's covered up because it's a, it's a, it's a cold night. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was good. You mm -hmm. know, we got one thing going for us. We got to. Right. But I'm not even listening to the chatter because the rotor, you know, the rotor's going not that far away. Uh, there's, there's noise from the generators, from the fire trucks. So I'm not hearing anything and I, I wasn't choosing to listen anyway. I right. just got the airway. Yeah. Um, so whooped up, this is before we had, a uh, 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 end title, um, waveform. This, I had a FEF. Remember the, the little color, color. Yeah. Ones? So yeah. I, I put that on, I think it turned purple. I mean. <laughs> it was dark. Oh, purple's out. not good. No, purple's bad. That's purple's right. Purple's bad. Thank yeah. you. So no, yeah, it did not turn purple. It was yeah. yellow. Yes, right. Okay. Yellow. Okay. So it was good. Good long sounds on one side. They said, I didn't hear that part though, because okay. I was busy showing my nurse. Check this out is this how tube you made an airway. You see yeah. this? I just got this too. Yeah. Um. So a patient, we put the patient in the life blanket. He's already covered up in the other blanket. We didn't see anything else. Uh, I never checked a radio pulse. Uh, we just listen. They listen to lung sounds, but I did not listen to what they said. Okay. All right. Load to the helicopter. We had this little helicopter. It's like the size of a VW, VW Beetle, just itty bitty little helicopter. Mm -hmm. And uh, load the patient in, and and I'm talking to the nurse about how great I did. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That too. Ego is strong. I, yes. I can't believe those guys could get that tube. It was right. so easy. Yeah. Yeah. And so we put him on the monitor. Heart rate's 146. I did pull up this chart a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Saved it. Just whenever oh, wow. my ego gets out of hand. Yeah. I look, you go I back look, and I look at old charts. Down a little bit. Right. Yeah. So, and so uh, the SATs, we couldn't get SATs because cold, right? Okay. Uh, and we would need to have the ability to put it on the ear at that time. It's just finger probes. Okay. And title, uh, Obviously, we didn't have a number, so I didn't know what the number was. Mm -hmm. So we put him on vent, and uh, we had a different ventilator at that time. And we weren't going by Arzenet by that at that time, where we were going. Mm -hmm. We were going much higher tidal volumes. So my tidal volume was seven eighty. Oh wow! Which is and how how big was this patient? Um, oh my gosh, five nine. It's about my okay. height. Okay. Yeah. How so much it should weigh? have been about uh, about four hundred tops. Oh wow! Yeah. So I'm going seven eighty. Peep of five. Respiratory rate, 12. Okay. Um, so we're going, and I'm still, I still have my ego just chitter-chatter. And the nurse really doesn't know. She's not that, that uh, she's not that into, or not new enough to the, what, is, what am I trying to say? She's not, she hasn't been employed enough to recognize what's right. going on. She doesn't on. have a system down yet of what she's going to be doing once right. you put a patient in the back she, of the helicopter. She's looking for me for guidance, and mm -hmm. I'm just sitting there. My, if there had been room, my legs had been crossed, and I had been, yeah. you know, stroking my hair and telling her all about my, my airway, right? Yeah. So we did, we did appropriate fentanyl and Versed, and then I gave back. Back in the day, we gave back to everybody. Okay. And so the reason we did that is because, in our mind, that was sedation because they didn't move. And if they didn't move, that made me feel good. And then once you see that tear running yeah. down the side of their, yeah. Oh, I guess I'll give a little more fentanyl. I guess I'll give a little more pain management. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so that, uh, so we gave back. We don't do that much anymore. No. Very little. Very little. Heart rate drops down to 76. I'm not thinking anything of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, so and maybe you're going to get into this. What are this guy's injuries from the <laughs> from the from the car wreck? Well, that's because you said question. it was a rollover. It's a great question. And was and I guess we didn't go. Was was he extricated? Uh, that's a great question. You don't know because <laughs> you weren't listening. I got the or airway. Yeah. See if I got the airway. Come on, buddy. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm following now. I'm following. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, no assessment. So these guys, to to this responding agency's credit, that you showed up to, they did. They, they did what they were, you know. They they got the patient out. Yeah. They covered the patient <clears throat> so they weren't hypothermic. Yeah. 
they recognized the need to our side of the patient, mm -hmm. so they were doing well on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll get it to what else they did here in a minute. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so they probably had shared all this stuff with you. You were just in La La Land. Like, I was just... Your arm was getting sore, patting itself on the back, Did you right? see my airway? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, my gosh. Right. I'm so embarrassed. So we get on the helipad, and um, uh, heart rate is down to 52. Okay. Uh, did I... I did say Ben Sandings, right? Yes. Yes. So, um, so the the... The high, uh, the PIP alarm is going off. We didn't have the the ability to check plats, P plats for that. The peak plat. inspiratory pressure PIP alarm. Correct. Yeah. And so that means it's, there's resistance. Mm -hmm. So whether it's in the tube, whether it's in the upper airways, whether it's somewhere, right? The plats, the the plateau pressure tells you where if what the health of the alveoli is. We did not have that capability. I might not even checked had we had it, right? Yeah. But that would have told me a lot, Jeez. because the the PIP. Right. Was just kept climbing. And what did I do? I just turned off the alarm. Right. Oh, that's just, annoying. It was, yeah, it was getting that go away. away. I'm talking right now. Right. You know? <laughs> right. So I'm just turning that off. Um, so we're going, we land on the helipad, start going down the elevator to the ER. So you're at a trauma center. Trauma center. Okay. Level one trauma center. You've already given a HEAR report. Let them know what you're dealing with. Yep. Well, it was, yeah. It wasn't a very good HEAR report. I right. just said, Hi, my name's Dan. I got the tube. We'll be there in 10. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <Okay. laughs> Put a little extra help on the right. hell bedroom. You go out of the right. helicopter, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> we need an extra gurney. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and so we're going down, and the heart rate gets down in the 30s. And then I start thinking, wow, why is it getting down in the 30s? Yeah, why is it dropping? Mm -hmm. And I check for radio pulse again. Or no, it's the first time I checked for radio pulse. There's no radio pulse. Then I check for carotid pulse. And then I start thinking, oh, my gosh. You know, start, my finger starts going all around, and there's no carotid pulse. Luckily, the door is open, and the trauma bay is 10 feet away. Okay. Rolling in the trauma bay, they, we, flipped the, we flipped the blanket over, this great big blanket, because we kept it nice and warm, mm -hmm. and it is full of blood, because his right arm had been amputated, and they put a tourniquet on, right. which I'm sure they which told the, me. I'm sure they told you, yeah. The only thing is, it, it had come loose. Oh. And he had bled out. We didn't see as we got out of the helicopter the huge streak of blood along the, the outside of the helicopter because it was his right arm that was taken out. Small helicopter, you Small can't see it. You can't see it, and it just oh my it gosh. just huge streak. And so um, they immediately did. They opened up his chest. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, he arrested just. Just as we were coming downstairs, I mean that always happens, right? Oh, he just coded. Right, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. this time we haven't been doing this for like twenty minutes. Yeah, <laughs> right. and so massive transfusion. Um, they, you know, obviously uh, put another tourniquet on. They were dealing with the arm, massive transfusion, um, and cardiac, cardiac um, internal cardiac ma massage. massage. Yep. Wow. So I mean, I'm watching this. Then I start thinking, oh my gosh, I think I messed up here. Yeah, but then I started thinking. Well, I did get the airway. <laughs> and I started backing up a little bit. Right. Just worked my way out of the trauma before people started talking to me. Yeah. And uh, he lived. Wow. So massive tension pneumo because once they opened up that chest, it was like an explosion in there. Just blood went everywhere. Yeah. So much pressure. Yeah. So I I didn't check for the the lung sounds. Obviously, he had signs of shock. Right. So I mean, you don't want to needle someone just because they have. Decreased blood, uh, lung sounds. Right. So you, you want to sign the shock yep. mechanism. He had mechanism. He had, had I done a good, a yeah. good uh, assessment, I would have noticed that there was broken ribs. Very right. issue right here. Right. Um, so massive tension. He obviously had massive blood loss. Mm -hmm. uh, his head was intact. Mm -hmm. uh, no thanks to me. Right. He, he's still alive. Yeah. Um, I mean, so... You know, we're, <clears throat> we're laughing here a little bit, and it's a, a nervous laugh, I'll be honest, but <laughs> you've obviously, you've, you've used that call to make yourself better, right? Absolutely. And I think one of the things that's so difficult about medicine is it's a practice, it's not a science, and we use each call to make ourselves better if we choose to look at it that way, and we don't get caught in a rut of... Right. You know, this is who I am. This is how I do it every time. And, you know, you get into that mindset of, you know, downplaying the call you're being dispatched to and this, that, and the other thing. So I guess what was, what was the fallout from that? What was, what was the repercussion that 
even if it was just with you personally. Um, so, so I went out to the helicopter, I saw all the blood. Mm -hmm. I noticed where my feet had been the entire time was on our blood cooler. We carried two units of blood. Oh man. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I start, I start thinking like, man, I could have done this. I could have done that. I could have recognized this. But at that point in my career, I was still, I don't know if it was, if it was my ego or if it was insecurity or what it was. I did discuss it with the nurse. Yeah. She thought, she thought that's just how it always goes. Right. Um, so did she learn from that call? Not initially. We talked about it several years afterwards. I said, hey, I got to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I really messed up. Yeah. And then. And then it all kind of came together for her. And I use this call quite a bit when I do when I do uh, airway classes, mm -hmm. because I want people to learn from my mistakes. And believe me, there are a lot of mistakes. And yeah, I'm sure the people who are listening to this have made mistakes. And that's okay. Yeah. As long as you recognize it, and you learn from it, like you said, mm -hmm. that's the key, right. And so what could I have done differently on this one? Um, first of all, I should have put the patient in the back of the ambulance initially yep. and, and done the airway there. That way we could do that thorough assessment, take the extra two minutes, open it up, take a look, see where, where it is. I would have known there was an arm missing. Right. Known there was a chest problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could put chest tubes in, the whole thing. We could have, all the stuff we could have done. Yeah. Um, I would have known I needed blood. Mm -hmm. um, so a good history back in the ambulance, thorough exam. Um, I wouldn't have used the VEC. Don't use that right. anymore. We, uh, we right. have rock now, but I rarely use that. Well, I'll use that as the the paralytic, the initial paralytic, because I'm not a fan of sucks, but right. that's just that's just me. Right. Um, and then uh, on these tourniquets, you got to recheck those tourniquets constantly to make sure. Yeah. There's there's a a bad habit we can get into is set it and forget it. Yes. And I know that I've seen a couple that I've put on look like they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. We get them from you know, wherever they're at on scene into the back of the ambulance and it's changed. It's exactly. now leaking again. Right. And so, and tourniquets are hard. Oh, I mean, super hard. they're super painful to put on. Mm -hmm. Patients want to punch you if they could. Right. This guy didn't, you know, he was missing one arm, but you know, he would have tried to swing at you with the other if he could have. Right. Um, and they're not, a, they're not always easy to put on. No. They can be very, very difficult. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I guess in, in, in hearing what you're telling me in the story and then replaying it, I can see where some of these, you know, little, you know, mistakes added up, you know, to something that was Huge. almost, you know, almost fatal, irreplaceable. Yeah. yeah. Another couple of minutes, dude would have been dead. Yeah. With a good airway. With a good airway. <laughs> you would have had a two of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so does your agency at that time, and do they now? Do you guys have a, a debrief after a critical call that is mandatory? So, How is that handled? Uh, on the helicopter side, most of the calls are critical calls. Yeah. So we really don't. Mm -hmm. um, I do it with the nurse all the time. Like, hey, because I, so much of the critical care stuff I'm really trying to learn after all these years is always trauma for me. I just love the trauma. Mm -hmm. And I'm really trying to get good on the critical care stuff. So I will debrief after every call and ask about this lab value or this or that just for my own. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if there's a mistake, like there's times when you go in, in, with an EMS agency who've done the same thing that I've done um, where I will debrief with them yeah. and say, hey, this is what I did in the past. Um, and you guys follow up. We follow up with, with the, the agency that, with, that called right, you, right? Right. Because yeah. we want them to make we want to make sure that they're okay with what happened, that we did all right, and that if we have feedback from them, because mm -hmm. that's the only way we learn. Yeah. If you don't know, learn from someone telling you. Mm -hmm. I know in my dealings with the agency you work for, when we've had to call them out, uh, they always do a great job of following up, and then, you know, they've even given us kudos, like, hey. Awesome job on the airway. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome job with the decompression. Right. Um, really appreciate you guys having that LZ set up the way you did. It was perfect. Right. Um, but yeah. Well, cool. Dan, um, I think that's all we got for this first episode, man. Um, I want to thank you for being open and honest, yep. being a little thank bit vulnerable. Um, it's not always the easiest thing to talk about our mistakes. And um, the beauty of it is, though, we can all learn from it and get better because someone's willing to talk about it. Right. Right. So... Awesome stuff. Um,
thank you to the listeners for uh, hearing out our first podcast. We're excited to be starting this thing up and uh, we'll definitely have more for you in the near future. So we'll see you guys on the next one.